hearing on proposal three, um, which is a proposal to amend the state's constitution to um, include the right to collectively bargain. Uh, this is um, based on uh, that the House is required under House rules to have a public hearing on a constitutional amendment under Rule 51A. Um, we're going to start tonight with committee introductions, and then I'll give a description of what this, how we're going to work this meeting tonight. Um, a lot of the text that I have in front of me is geared towards more of a primary, um, of, a, of a hybrid notice, but we have so many people here tonight, you can just take in what we're saying and apply it to here. Um, but there's going to be some, some um, protocols about being online as well. So uh, we'll start right here with introductions. Uh, I'm <coughs> Representative Robin Chestnut Tangerman from the Rutland Bennington District. I'm Representative Dennis Labani, and I'm from Caledonia 3 District. And I'm Representative Larry Labor, and I'm from Essex Orleans District 1. Representative Saudia Lamont, Lamoille, Washington District. I'm Elizabeth Burrow, Representative Elizabeth Burrows, and I represent Windsor 1, which is Heartland, West Windsor, and Windsor. Kathleen James, and I represent Bennington 4 District. <coughs> Representative Mary Howard, and I represent Rutland City District 6. Representative Emily Krasnow, and I represent Chittenden 9, South Burlington. Representative Caleb Elder, Addison 4 District. Rep Ashley Bartley, and I am in Franklin 1, which is Fairfax in Georgia. And Representative Tom Stevens from Waterbury, representing the Washington Chittenden District. I'm the chair of the General and Housing Committee who is hosting this meeting this evening. Um, this hearing will be live streamed on our committee's YouTube channel and those joining remotely will notice that you can see and hear everything in the room but you're going to be unable to control your video and audio for now. You should all be able to see the list of speakers for today in your chat box in the Zoom. Um, I'll call out the names whether I'll just be calling out the names throughout the evening of the people who are up next and the person on deck. When I call your name, our committee assistant, if you're online, will promote you for being an attendee to being a panelist. The screen may flicker when this happens, and you may need to turn your video on and your audio as well. And once you're oriented and begin to speak, the timer will start, and that applies for those of you who are live. We'll give you the time to settle into your chair, and, um, and after you introduce yourself, that's when the timer will start. We're assigning three minutes to speak your thoughts this evening. The timer will turn yellow when you have 30 seconds remaining. When the time is up, the timer will turn red, and we ask that you finish any sentences or thoughts at that time to make space for the next person in line. Once complete, we'll move you back. Um, for the folks online, we'll move you back to the attendee area where you may continue watching the hearing. Abuse of the time limit will result in removal from the meeting. So please speak clearly and respectfully. Any appropriate banners, online background images, vulgar or inappropriate language will be caused for immediate dismissal from this hearing. And if you have any technical trouble, please use the chat function in Zoom to communicate with our support staff. Um, do not use the chat to promote your position on speaking points. It's strictly for logistical help with our staff. Um, we hope that this public hearing serves as a useful platform for citizens to voice their opinions to us in a respectful, effective way. And with that, let's get started. I want to start by... Um, <coughs> he's, he's right. he just okay. Okay. And um, the first thing I really want to do is to actually read the proposal. It's not that long. Um, Mr. And Chair, if anyone wants, there are copies here as well. Okay, and to explain this process, which I'll actually start with, a constitutional amendment starts in the Senate. It can only happen every four years. There's a, there's a cycle. Um, and a, a proposal for amendment like this one has to be approved in two bienniums. And so we're at the end of the first biennium. This proposal just came to us recently. And if we pass this through our committee and through the House, it will then go into um, storage, if you will. And then next biennium, 
it will be contemplated again by the Senate and the House. And if it passes that a second biennium, it will then go to the voters for a, uh, for a vote in the November election of 2026. That's how we got here today with this language. This passed the Senate um, earlier this year. And it just simply reads that this, this proposal, section one, the purpose, is this proposal would amend the Constitution of the State of Vermont to provide that the citizens of the state have a right to collectively bargain. Section 2, Article 23 of Chapter 1 of the Vermont Constitution is added to read Article 23, the right to collectively bargain, that employees have a right to organize or join a labor organization for the purpose of collectively bargaining with their employer through an exclusive representative of their choosing for the purpose of negotiating wages, hours, and working conditions and to protect their economic welfare and safety in the workplace. Therefore, no law shall be adopted that interferes with, negates, or diminishes the right of employees to collectively bargain with respect to wages, hours, and other terms and conditions of employment and workplace safety, or that prohibits the application or execution of an agreement between an employer and a labor organization representing the employer's employees that requires membership in the labor organization as a condition of employment. Section 3, effective date, the amendment set forth in this proposal shall become a part of the Constitution of the State of Vermont on the first Tuesday after the first Monday of November 2026 when ratified and adopted by the people of this state in accordance with the provisions of 17 VSA Chapter 32. That's it. Um, we are here to listen. It's not a really a back and forth or Q&A. Uh, and I would just ask us to, um, again, participate respectfully. And with that, I would ask that Liz, Elizabeth Medina, who uh, is here, to come forward to be the first um, witness on deck is Shadi Bata, a self-advocate from Barrytown. Should I sit here? Uh, or? We put a little okay. table block there, so yes, you're <laughs> Yes, welcome. all right, thank you. Well, um, I guess uh, it's good to be first. Uh, I'm always a little nervous when public speaking, believe it or not, but um, I'm really glad to be here to be part of this um, historic amendment. My name is Liz Medina. I am the executive director of the Vermont State Labor Council, AFL-CIO, which is a federation of labor unions here in Vermont, and we represent 20,000 AFL-CIO unions. And I have seen firsthand over my years how belonging to a union has materially and in many other ways benefited uh, our members' lives, whether that's in terms of better wages and working conditions, protection from harassment and discrimination in the workplace, um, safety in the workplace uh, is always a big issue, and also the sense of community that it builds um, in the workplace and beyond, um, which you know has an important uh, role when we face disasters as a community together too, especially with the July floods this past year. Um, we had union members come together in Barrie to help the community and distribute food, and actually we had union members with their various skills um, help uh, residents clean out their home and do re <coughs> repairs. Um, so I really think it's important to support uh, unions and enshrine their right to organize because they offer so much to workers not only who are in unions, but workers everywhere and also community members at large as well. Um, and I'll just say, personally, I'm here um, as living proof of that difference. Um, I got my first union job in 2015 at Goddard College um, as a staff member. And it was um, the first time where I really felt that I had a sense of job security and a voice on the job over my pain working conditions. Um, and because this, of this job, I was able to save for my first home here in Vermont, and I'm now um, happy to announce that we're starting a family here in Vermont. Um, so I came from out of state as a, you know, a youngish person, <laughs> um, and uh, what kept me here is my union job. And um, that's one of the many reasons why um, I'm such a big proponent and advocate in the, in the position I'm in today as well. 
Um, so I just want to thank you for taking on this tremendous task at a time when workers' rights are under attack across the country to make sure Vermont um, you know, supports workers and, and the value of uh, workplace democracy and um, being able to advocate for yourself. So uh, thank you so much, and um, I'm pretty sure you'll hear from others who will say the same. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up we have Shadi Bata, and then next will be John Stafford, and then on deck, Zachary Overlaw. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shadi Bata, and I'm a resident of Berrytown. English is my third language, so I have my notes. If you have any questions, please uh, stop me and ask me to repeat myself. I come to you today as a former trainer uh, for the CWA Local 1400 as, and as a former member of uh, Hester Drut Labor Organization in Israel-Palestine. I wasn't until I, be, I became an employee of the legislative staff that I did not belong to a union. Anyone who works in the state of Vermont should have the right to organize or join a labor organization. We should have the right uh, to be represented to negotiate wages, uh, hours, and working conditions, and to protect ourselves in the workplace. Uh, over the, the year, from my experience, from my experience uh, legislature has enacted laws protecting employees throughout the public and private sectors. Almost every other public employee has just caused protection and due process rights in the event of termination. Uh, most have the right to union representation. The administrative staff at the Supreme Court are union members. Legislative employees in Maine and elsewhere are represented by unions. Supervisors and responsible professionals throughout state government belong to unions and most managers are classified employees who have due process rights and can challenge adverse actions before the labor board. Yet, here at the, Gen the Vermont General Assembly, the people working to make sure our legislator uh, run do not have the same rights. And there is no way of asking for one since workers in this building or in this organization are not unionized. There are also no way of asking for changes in policies or, the, or documentation that pre pertain working conditions here because once again, legislative staff are not able to unionize. Uh, these failures make any process of legislative employees go through less legitimate and make it more likely that someone somewhere along the way will make a mistake. We are all humans uh, based on personal feelings or bias rather, rather than a well thought out process that all, both employers and employees, agree to. It is time for this the staff in this building, in this organization, to be treated as every other public employer as if expected to be treated, uh, giving them just cause some basic due process and the right to join a union and bargain collectively. This proposal would be the first step on that journey. So I'm asking you all today to allow Proposal 3 to pass, allow it to continue on the process of being put as a question towards the people of Vermont. Allow Vermonters to the chance to vote and establish workers' rights as part of our state constitution. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Sadi. OK, next up I have John Stafford. Zachary Overlazan is next, and then um, Paul Van Appeldorn is on the Zoom on deck. I would just like to ask that the Proposal 3 has passed. Um, this protects us, and I think it actually helps be better employees, better workers for the individual towns. 
because of the respect that's shown by our management that we didn't really have before we had a union. Um, our rights are, we have resources that we can ask questions for. We would lose all that if they took our collective bargaining unit away. Um, I think this union and our bargaining unit really needs to be protected because we are under attack. Um, and you never know, we don't want to lose this off our books, please. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. <clears throat> And next up, I have Zachary Overla, and I hope I didn't butcher your name for the third time. Um, and then Paul Van Appledorn is next with Larry Moquin on deck. Welcome. Hello. My name is Zachary Overla. I'm here to advocate for Prop 3, a crucial measure that seeks to protect the right to organize for Vermonters, even in the face of potential federal challenges. I'm before you today as a proud member of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local 2326. I am currently employed by the American Red Cross in the Blood Services Division, where my colleagues and I are fortunate to be organized through IBU Local 2326, where we have experienced the difference between um, being unionized and not unionized, especially myself firsthand, because it is my first union job. And I definitely have noticed a difference with fair pay better health care benefits, um, as well as like a very much safer workplace, and fairly more like cared about by our employer and heard. This amendment is not just about protecting the present, but is about safeguarding the future for all Vermonters. It is about ensuring that workers have a voice, that their concerns are heard and addressed, and that their welfare is protected. Collective bargaining is a fundamental pillar of a fair and just society, and Prop 3 seeks to strengthen this pillar. The text of Prop 3 is clear in its purpose and intent. It states that employees have the right to organize or join a labor organization for the purpose of collectively bargaining with their employer. This amendment protects workers' economic welfare and safety in the workplace, ensuring that no law will interfere, negate, or diminish their right to collectively bargain. Prop 3 aligns perfectly with the oath you took when you first as, um, assumed office, empowering workers and preventing any interference or diminishment of their collective bargaining rights. In closing, I urge each of you to support Prop 3 and uphold your commitment to the people of Vermont. Let us stand together in solidarity to protect the rights of Vermont workers and create a future where fairness, equality, and justice prevail in our state. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. <coughs> right, next up on Zoom, we have Paul Van Appledorn. And then after that, it'll be Larry Moquin and Jean Goodwin is on deck. Paul, are you there? I see that you're muted. Is that better? I can hear you now, yeah. Now we can see you. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks for giving me the opportunity today to, uh, to speak in support of Proposition 3. Um, I have a little story. When I first came to Vermont about 11 years ago, I was working on my house, which needed uh, my new house, which needed a lot of work. And uh, I realized I was going to have to get a job soon. So I started looking, I'm a carpenter by trade, carpenter builder, and I started looking just on the local ads, Craigslist and whatnot, and I saw that the wages were quite low, and I thought, oh, I wonder what the state is uh, paying for a wage. So I looked that up, and I was uh, a bit dismayed, and I actually worked for the state of Massachusetts uh, almost 30 years ago. So I, I looked up what they were paying then. This is back in 2014, 15. And I saw that the wage had gone up $8 in near 30 years. I was uh, kind of shocked. So I decided to um, incorporate the CPI index for every year since then, basically the standard of living cost. And what I came out and just pretty easy calculations that the value of what we earn now, and this goes for teachers, um, uh, nurses, uh, tradespeople, was 34% of what it was 
30 years before that. So what we make is only a, almost a third of what it was. And during that time in the 80s, um, with policies from the Reagan era and the downplaying, the unions, um, the voice of the worker was uh, less and less to the point where we now are so undervalued as workers that, um, you know, just passing proposition is just the first step. I think um, for an individual to go up against a state government, a federal government, um, a corporation is just, it's, it's absolutely impossible. We need a collective bargain in order to have a fair say and a, and a, and a fair hearing. And, uh, and that's why I support it. Thanks for the time. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, Larry Moquin, and then Jean Goodwin is next, and Nicole DeVita is online after that, on deck. Good evening. Um, Larry Moquin, I am the Vice President of Vermont Building and Construction Trades. I'm also the Field Supervisor for Laborers Local 668, which covers uh, Vermont. Uh, we're here in support of Proposal 3. I'm not going to keep you too long. We know that unions set the standard for all workers and uplift all workers. So without unions, uh, Vermont will end up a race to the bottom like many right-to-work states are. Um, we hope that this will come out of committee unanimously as it did in the Senate because this isn't a union or non-union. This is just about workers in general and we set the standards. Um, I thank you for taking this up, and I also thank you for the swift action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> All right, Jean Goodwin. And next will be Nicole DeVita. And then on deck is Alex Poffin. Jean, welcome. Thank you. Hello, uh, Jean Goodwin. I am a, a member of Carpenters Local 327. I am a 42-year member. I started in 1982 as an apprentice, was um, given the opportunity to be trained uh, very well by the Carpenters Union through an apprenticeship program. I worked, um, I retired in 2016 with a 30-year pension. I'm proud to say the first woman in my local to receive a 30-year pension. Um, I've owned property in Vermont in Hubberton since 2014 on beautiful Lake Hortonia. Mm -hmm. And because of the training and the safety and the career that I had, I was able to build a, a home on that lake and um, resident of Vermont. And, um, and uh, um, sorry, um, very proud of what the Carpenters Union did for me. <coughs> And, and the fact that we have people that, that handle this collective bargaining and, and, and afforded us a pension and an annuity and a, 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 a fair living wage and the safety to go to work every day and, and, and not be harassed and, and to uh, earn a living and, and, and a future. And basically, this is, there's no downside to this. It's for the future. Of, sons, daughters, granddaughters, grandsons, um, going forward. I think it, it's just a good thing to have on your books. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Jim. I'm taking the tablecloth. <laughs> <laughs> OK, next up we have Nicole DeVita, who should be here online. Nicole, did I butcher your name properly, or did I get you right? You got me right. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Nicole DeVita. I am the co-president for healthcare of AFT Vermont. AFT Vermont represents workers in both healthcare and higher education. Within the past six years, AFT Vermont has doubled in size from approximately 5,000 members to 10,000. We at AFT Vermont are in support of Proposal 3. Labor unions are the foundation of the working class. Unions give workers the ability to level the power structure between themselves and their employer. The Wagner Act of 1935 was a landmark law that boosted workers' rights and unions in the US. 
12 years later, after an unprecedented number of strikes in 1947, the Taft-Harley Act was passed to reduce the power of the working class. It enabled states to become right-to-work states or pro-business states. So studies have shown that in these right-to-work states, wages are approximately 7.5% less and unionization falls by approximately 13%. In Vermont, it was not until 1969 that the first group of public sector employees won the right to organize for improved working conditions, wages, and other benefits. Following this, in 1972, the first private sector hospital workers won the right to organize and form a union. I spent the first 10 years of my career in New York employed at a private healthcare facility. When I came to Vermont, I knew fairly little about unions. The notion that I had a say in my working conditions was foreign to me. It took a bit of time to realize that I was within my rights to voice concerns over workplace conditions, which are often directly related to patient care in the healthcare field. Who shouldn't have a say when you spend the majority of your time at your workplace? After being a part of a union, I would never consider entering into employment that did not have a union. I value not only my voice, but those of my coworkers in ensuring that we have a say in our work life. We support proposal three and believe that this proposed amendment is necessary to ensure that Vermonters can come together and negotiate for fair working conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up I have Alex Potvin and then um, Kim Hokinson, and then on deck, John Bonneville. Alex, welcome. Hi, good evening members of the committee. Um, first off, I need to thank the members of the Senate um, for their unanimous support of this uh, constitutional amendment. Uh, my name is Alex Potvin. I'm here on behalf of Local 693, uh, the plumbers and pipe fitters here in Vermont. Uh, a little background on myself. I started in, um, I, was <clears throat> I was born in Burlington in uh, um, 1985 and I've lived in the islands since then. Uh, in 2006, I started an apprenticeship with a private union company. Uh, Cooper Mechanical. Since then, I progressed as a rank and file member. Uh, I was elected um, as an officer of my local union uh, and then went to a full time employee of the union uh, as an organizer and recruiter. Um, I tell you this not to give you a history lesson about myself, um, but to drive home the fact that union membership has a positive and generational impact on the very people of this state and around our country. Uh, as a lifelong Vermonter and 20-year union member, I cannot stress enough the benefits of union membership. Uh, they've not only paved the way for me to raise a family and have a fulfilling career in the mechanical field, uh, but also allowed me to remain as a resident of this great state. Uh, without the protections and backing of my union, as well as support from fellow brothers and sisters, uh, this may very well have not have been the case. Uh, my story here is not unique to me. Uh, you will find this to be the case across the board uh, when it comes to union membership. Uh, in 2009, support of unions was at its all-time low in this country uh, since the peak of its popularity in the 1950s. Uh, we have seen a rapid increase in support of unionism and collectively bargained uh, working agreements uh, with over a 20% increase in support among the American population since 2009. Uh, while the support from the working class has grown, we've also seen an attack on the rights to collectively bargain uh, from corporations and lawmakers at a level that's been unprecedented since the initial labor movement that gave birth to the power that the working class held in this country. Uh, these lawmakers who are beholden to these large corporations seek to undermine the ability to collectively bargain and in turn strip the working class people in this country of their rights and freedoms, freedoms that this country was founded on. Uh, the reason for these attacks is not unfounded uh, and is really quite simple. In order for corporations to keep power, they need the working class divided. Um, <clears throat> when the working class is unified through the power of a collective bargaining agreement, the balance of power is shifted to the people. This is the one proven way to uplift the working class as we have seen in this country on numerous occasions. Our small but mighty state has been a leader in many ways, and I strongly urge this committee uh, to help Vermont continue this tradition of being a leader of freedom and personal liberties, uh, enshrine the right to collectively bargain in our state's constitution in order to ensure the prosperity of the working class people in the state. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next up is Kim 
Hokanson or Hokanson? Oh, Hokanson, you got it right the first time. That's great. <laughs> Doesn't often happen. It gets a little nervous down there. Um, so, and next up will be John Bonneville, and on deck will be Francis Vachero. Um, again, I hope I didn't put your that name as well. Kim, welcome. Excellent, thank you. Uh, good afternoon or evening, wherever we are at this point. My name is Kim Hokanson. I'm um, the Northern New England Regional Manager for the North Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters. Very long name. Um, but I'm here uh, to, to actually read our testimony from our Executive Secretary Treasurer, but I'll also give you just a little brief of myself. So I'm an 18-year member of the Carpenters Union. Um, started as an apprentice, like anyone pretty much who was in a union. Uh, was able to go through the apprenticeship, um, became a journey person, uh, then became a four person, and then became a road supervisor. So I've had that experience of going through the union and what it can offer for all the women in the room. Uh, it levels the playing field, which is awesome, right? So the training is there, the education is there, safety and all these things that everyone else has said, but it also levels the playing field that my pay is the same as the person sitting straight and all the way around. So to me, in terms of personal, that it was a very, very big deal in terms of the union. Now on to the reading of the thing. So let's see how I do here. On behalf of more than three, uh, 30,000 members of the North Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters, I'm writing and reading to request that your support of PR3, a constitutional amendment to guarantee Vermont workers' rights to collectively bargain. Since the founding of our nation, the people of Vermont have led efforts to establish and preserve our nation's fundamental freedoms, advancing equality and protecting the rights of all working people. We encourage you to continue this tradition of leadership by becoming the second state in the nation to pass this important legislation that would enshrine workers' rights into the state's constitution. While all workers in Vermont are currently have the right to organize, these rights are under attack in the Washington and in state capitals across the nation by well-funded corporate special interests. In addition, for the last decade, the Supreme Court has been increasingly hostile to organized workers by established right to work for all public sector employees, Janus versus AFSME in 2018, undermining the right <coughs> to organize by restricting the rights to access employees on their work sites, Cedar Point versus Hassad in 2021, and are poised to potentially undermine unions' right to strike, Glacier Northwest versus International um, Brotherhood of Teamsters in 2023. In our neighboring states, my current home state of New Hampshire, well-funded corporate special interest groups have pushed so-called right to work for the last 30 plus years. Um, I'm happy to report that we finally defeated it again this year, and it won't be coming to New Hampshire this year, but that is the whole point of this, is so that you don't have to do that for 30 years every two years, so, and waste your time as well as all the, all the public time. Uh, while public support of unions is at a uh, six-year high, union membership has declined dramatically over the last 40 years in Vermont and around the country because of these relentless attacks. We see the impacts of this decline in, re in Vermont, especially in our construction sector, that has seen a degradation of wages and working conditions as Ununionized rates have fallen according to the recent study of the Century Foundation. And Vermont has the highest rates of construction worker misclassification in the nation. This means that thousands of workers are not paid their fair wages. They do not have access to employer health care or benefits, uh, the pension benefits, as well as not being a, a part of the state workers' compensation system. This hurts all Vermont citizens because it drives down wages, increases poverty, and overburdens the state's um, safety net programs. Stronger unions are the key to addressing this problem and now is a critical and important time to protect these rights, to organize and to help unions grow in Vermont. We believe it's time <coughs> to codify and put the labor union um, rights and workers' rights in by passing PR3. I'll leave it at that because I'm all over. Thank you very much. And I will pass out the testimony if that's all right. Um, you can pass it Sorry. out, certainly. Yep. Yeah, just so you have it. I apologize for. <laughs> yeah, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, John Bonner. <clears throat> And then on deck is Francis Vachero, and I'm sorry, next is Francis Vachero, and on deck is Charles Russell. Okay. Um, is Francis here? 
and Charles. And after Charles, we have um, our last witness scheduled for tonight is Walter Smith. Okay, my name is Charles Russell, uh, R-O-S-S-E-L-L. -L. I live in Cabot, Vermont. I've been a member of the United Brotherhood of Carpenters, Vermont Local 349, since 1997. Once upon a time in Vermont, unions, construction unions, were strong. If this is one of the older buildings on this block, it was probably built union. Now when maintenance is done on it by a non-union company, chances are my taxes are paying the di Dr. Dinosaur for those workers' kids. I don't begrudge them that. The point is that the union workers are less of a burden to the taxpayers. Uh, currently, there's not much organized anti-union proposals for legislation in Vermont because unions are not that strong here, but we're going to be. Uh, because uh, right now we don't have a lot of market share, you don't get that. Uh, we do talk a good game about livable wages here in Vermont, but if I cross any of our borders, be it to Montreal, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, or New York, and work union, I make significantly more money. And that is why in New Hampshire, every legislative session, it's brought up these right to work for less laws. It wastes a lot of legislators' time and a lot of our time going to fight that. And that's what one of the things that this would do <clears throat> is prevent that from happening in the future when we're stronger and you will certainly get those propositions to pass a right to work for less law. Thanks for hearing me out. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Charles. <clears throat> and is Walter Smith here? Okay. No. All right, are there any other folks who are here who um, haven't signed up who might want an opportunity? Walter Smith. What's that? He's so we're kind of at the end of our list of people who have signed up. If there's anyone here, I don't see anybody jumping up. Um, I would then say that we're done um, for this public hearing. I would appreciate I appreciate everybody who's testified, who signed up to testify and shared their um, share their thoughts on a proposal. Three. Um, does anybody, any of our guests or witnesses, have a question for us about the process or about what it's going to be like moving forward? Um, so I would say stay tuned. Then again, we will consider this for passage and uh, through our committee and then. It, uh, once it goes through our committee, again, another wrinkle <coughs> is that rather than one day on notice, we have it on notice for four days, and then it would come up for second reading, what's called second reading, and then um, that would be the floor dis uh, the discussion on the floor. And if it passes that, then again it goes into, um, it summers over into the next biennium, and then it'll be taken up in the next biennium in the same process. Do you know why it sits for four days on the notice calendar? I can't say anything better than that's the rule. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, I think it just generally fits with the notion in Vermont that changing the Constitution should be difficult and should be different. And so it gives people an opportunity to see that it's, if people are seeing that it's posted on notice, they have an opportunity to weigh in um, much more than we have for a conventional uh, bill. All right, with that, then I would um, suggest that this public hearing is over. Thank you so much for your time and for coming out tonight.